Okay, on the show today, uh, we want to discuss a young lady named Haley Welch. And she's known by a different name that I don't think is right or appropriate to call her. (laughs) And after that, we will discuss the rise of God, AI or artificial intelligence. And then next, we'll discuss the homelessness problem. And then we'll end with our Reddit Christianity question of the week. It's going to be a good show. Let's get to it. Welcome in. This is Religionless Christianity. I'm your host, Spencer, joined as always by my beautiful wife, Nikki. Hello. And we are grateful that you are here. We're glad that you're joining us. If you're new, don't let the name fool you. We are not religionless, and this show is not religionless. It is very Christian, but it's more the world, and specifically this nation, um, as we're about to talk about, that is increasingly secular or religionless, you could say, in that at least in part, is where the name of the show comes from. Uh, But we're going to do what we try to do every Saturday on this podcast, and that's just look at these stories from around this religionless world and try to navigate them with what we think is a biblical worldview as best we can, how to make sense of it all. So like Nikki mentioned, uh, we are going to be talking about Haley Welch, uh, who does go by another more, um, I don't know, disgusting nickname. So we're going to do our best to avoid using it. If we slip, I will try to edit it in post. And if I still slip, please forgive us. But um, that's where we'll start. I think it's important that we have this discussion. Then, like she said, we'll move into AI, God AI. You guys that have been here for a while know how I feel about AI. It's likely the Antichrist, but um, we're going to keep talking about it. Then we'll get into this discussion on homelessness, which near and dear to our heart here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And then again, I think we have a good Reddit, uh, Reddit Christianity question to answer. Um, we try to you know answer questions on Reddit that are things that people have probably heard before or are likely to hear again. If we can find one of those, we try to answer it. And I think this is one of those questions, you know, at least in recent years, you've probably dealt with this question. So stick around for that at the end. And just as a throw in, I think we have good recommended listening this week. Comes from an old uh, favorite, not a favorite, but an old uh, church that we enjoyed listening to. So we'll recommend that here at the end as well. Also, I don't say this often, but the episode's time-stamped if you're on YouTube or even on the podcast, whatever, Rumble. So if any of these stories interest you specifically, you can jump to them. Though I recommend you just sit back, relax, and listen to the whole thing in one setting. That's the way to do it. But all <laughs> right, uh, before we get into all of these stories, honey, do you have any prayer requests or praise reports, anything of that sort? Um. Not anything really new. All the same stuff. Praise God always, but always pray for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't really have any big prayer requests. Uh, I will mention, I read a couple stories this week about, you know, Christian persecution. I like to remind you guys as often as I can think of it to pray for the persecuted church. I saw a story uh, that somebody that was kind of protesting, or I guess I would call it more evangelizing outside of an abortion clinic. He just avoided an 11 year prison sentence. So he, you know, was spared on that. But, you know, people will say Christians aren't persecuted in in this nation. But I would say that is a level of persecution um, right there that you go and evangelize outside of an abortion clinic and you get thrown in prison for it. I would call that persecution. So just you know, persecution is the name of the game when it comes to being a Christian. So, you know, when you got your prayer time laid out, try to carve out some time for the persecuted church in this country and around the world, because we do have brothers and sisters really suffering um, for the sake of Christ, and they need our prayers. So uh, pray for them. But All right. We're going to go ahead and get started with maybe Nikki's favorite story of the entire year. Boy, was she joyful to be discussing this story. 
She was mm-hmm. not. Uh, I had to yeah. drag her to this You bring story. up the um, name and you Haley said Wells. the name that everybody calls her by. And I was like, what? What? What are you saying? <laughs> yeah, she <laughs> was none too pleased. I had to do some coaxing to get her on board with the story. But I think it's just a really important story. You know, the nickname is derogatory and shameful. Um, how she is known is derogatory and shameful. So we're going to do our best to call her by her God-given name, Haley Welch. Um, those of you who know who she is, you know who she is. And those of you who don't, you may stumble across who she is or seen her in some other setting. But, you know, Nikki was not super pumped about this, but I just think it's such an important story to talk about. And I didn't really realize it until, you know, it already been a story for about a week or so. So we're not going to play the original video. She sort of caught lightning in a bottle on social media and has garnered an insane amount of social media stardom, if you will. Uh, But the videos are obscene. You know, they're gross to listen to. So we're not going to play them. But um, her name is Haley Welch. She's 23 years old. And how she got famous was she was interviewed by some like YouTube or social media group or team. I don't know really what they are. It's called Tim and D TV, like D E E TV. Um, so that among probably other things, I went to their YouTube page. It's deplorable, you know? Um, but among the many things they do, they kind of do like man on the street style interviews, but asking more like really inappropriate questions is kind of their shtick there. Well, they interviewed Haley Welch, um, and you know the question that they asked was sort of, "How can you, you know, please a man in bed?" Sort of a thing. And Haley's response has become basically her nickname now. And uh, we're, you know, we'll just leave it at that. It was a, you know, something you do in bed with a partner, and that became her nickname. And, uh, yeah, I was going to try to be a little more specific about the act, but we can just, for Nikki's sake, forego it all. But irregardless, right, the, the video blew up. She's garnered millions and millions of views just from those videos. But then she's been, you know, if you've ever, ever been on TikTok, you've seen sort of the popular videos that get sort of green screened out and then they get mm-hmm. kind of added into all sorts of other videos and she's gained millions of other views kind of being used in that way. And that's actually how I saw her. Um, I never saw the original video, but I would see her sort of like green screened over, you know, silly things. It would be like, you know, her, you know, saying what she said with someone like, this is what I do every time my wife puts onions in my food or something, you know, something goofy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I kind of ignored it. You know, she got social media famous, but a lot of people do nowadays. So I kind of ignored it. But then I saw this article here that she was invited on stage during a Zach Bryan concert in Nashville. And that really made me sad when I saw that, you know, um, really made me sad. And that's what kind of set me off that like, man, we should talk about this. So, you know, who is this Haley Welch? Um, You can find a little bit about her. But from my reading, just briefly, uh, this girl, and feel free to jump in whenever you want. This is kind of me just rambling here on her. But she was like this country girl living with her grandmother in a small town called Belfast, Tennessee. She was like working for a spring factory, which I'm assuming just makes springs. (laughs) And uh, she went from that. And then like essentially overnight, she became one of the most famous women on social media and famous in a deplorable way for essentially talking about how to, you know, be with somebody in bed. Um, that's how she became famous. Uh, and it's what's really bad about her, you know, going on stage with whoever this, oh, Zach Bryan and anybody else who wants to bring her on stage and just make her more known 
And then people are like, oh, who is she? And then they go and find out the horrible things she's said. I mean, not everybody thinks it's horrible, but it's just. Well, and that's what we're up. talking about it because people think it's funny. Yeah. So it's just like you're making it worse by having her on. I don't know. Just Oh, you definitely paint yourself in a really. <laughs> yeah. Again, I don't know a lot about Zach Bryant, but as soon as I saw this story, I was like, oh, he's a dirtbag. All right. Got it. And, uh, you know, I'm assuming you guys have heard of Zach Bryan before. I Very know the popular name. Guy. But yeah. I can't be like, I, I'm sure I've heard a song, but I'm not going to I know like, the name. Him. I'm certain I've heard the songs, but I can't pin down what any of them are. But I know he's popular. He's a country star. And, uh, yeah, and this is why this interests me, because much of country music sort of has its roots in like traditional values or more traditional faith values and stuff. And, uh, Zach Bryant, you know, I went and looked as quickly as I could just to see if he had any sort of faith at all. And I didn't see anything that highlighted specifically that he had faith, but in his songs, he has a lot of references to God and faith. So don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he does reference God and faith frequently in his music. So I would assume that he is, um, But that, again, is kind of why this Haley Welch story bothers me. You know, if this was some, you know, godless hip-hop star, Puff Daddy, bringing her on stage, you'd be like, sure, makes sense. But a country music star, traditional values, faith values in their music, bringing her on stage, I think, sends a different message. Um, People do whatever just to get more attention. Like, right. Even if it's And I can't wrong. imagine he needs more attention. <laughs> right. I mean, he it's sells like, out 60,000 person stadiums for his music. He gets a lot of attention. Well, he's just trying to help her. Like, I get bring somebody on stage who actually has a skill, um, you know, a talent, something to actually look up to. But right. what, why are you having problem. someone like this on your stage? You want your fans to imitate this person or is she just like a comedy show? It didn't seem like it was a comedy show. Um, you know, I watched a short clip of her. She didn't do a lot on stage except for say the line she's famous for. I'd be embarrassed um, if I was her really oh, like of course people you trying to just prop you up. She was, I mean, I didn't see the video. I'm assuming I don't know. Maybe she was out of the town. Maybe she, she had some drinks. Drunk. So, and you say that, and you just go with it. Like, that's embarrassing. Like, I can just imagine if somebody came up to me. I, I think about that. Like, if one of these people came up and tried to interview me, even if it was something I could answer. Like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what kind of content that you have on your channel or whatever. Like, I don't want any part of it. And I'm just one of those people that just kind of goes blank though when I'm put on the spot. So, anyway, I can't imagine. I don't know why people would go with this. So like fame for whatever. It just shows that you will just be famous for whatever. Well, right. And again, all of this is going to be preference with Haley Welch bears the bulk of this blame. She makes the, makes the decisions. She's running head headlong into this new life for her. But I think it still says more about us. And that's why I wanted mm-hmm. to address it. You know, even the Zach yeah. Bryan stuff, you know, because... Again, his music has faith and stuff laced through it. And I would assume that his listeners and his followers and fans, right, that they're probably believers as well. They probably have faith because his music is laced with faith. Right, right. And yet even still, with all that, Zach Bryan in this culture sees fit to bring this young lady who, again, is famous for, um, you know, bedroom tactics if you want to call it it that he brings her on stage at his concert yeah and people went crazy for it when really that should bother all of us that hold to a traditional christian faith but what it said in i can't remember what article what they like about her not really just what she said it's just that she has this personality where she doesn't take herself too seriously and that's what they're she propping her up. Serious. Well, that's what that's what stood out to me. They like her because she's a girl that doesn't take herself too seriously. But anybody, if she had a few drinks that night, whenever she was interviewed, nobody takes themselves seriously. 
if they're tipsy. Like people say stupid stuff. Yeah. But either way, like we don't. How far do you go? Do you go further than that than that and just and just say, well, I just don't take myself too seriously, and then the world applauds you because you do what you want because all in the name of not taking yourself too seriously. Well, and her not taking herself seriously is going to add a lot of zeros to her bank account, which in our society, yeah, that's a rousing success. But that, but that's the message that they want to get out is girls, just quit taking yourself too seriously. Be a little more wild. Live on the edge. That's the message. Well, consider this story. She blows up the most famous person on social media right now, you know, beloved by everybody for some reason. And then you look at just the other side where you have like Harrison Butker, who's like, women, mm-hmm. you'll find your true joy and happiness by raising a family and taking care of them in the home. And he's crucified, right? They want him kicked off his football team and all these sorts of things. Yeah, and it's like, what if this country singer put him up on the stage and let him actually share a good dare. message? But this is important, you know, because we just ended Pride Month and, you know, we in the Christian camp, we rail against the sexual immorality of the alphabet mafia, you know, the sins of their lifestyle, the need for repentance, the vulgarity of their messages, you know, all the stuff, the messaging they send to children, how damaging it is. We rail against all of that. And then what? Two days later, or the day after, or I don't even remember when this exactly happened. It could have been right at the tail end of Pride Month. Haley Welch goes and does what she does. And in the very next turn, right, we invite this woman who became famous for her bedroom tactics up on stage. And you look around and you go, boy, I wonder why all these godless people call us hypocrites and our, you know, our cries against their immorality fall on deaf ears. And it's because we don't actually mean what we say. Again, Zach Bryan laces his music with faith. I'm assuming much of his fan base is faith-based. And yet they cheer and go crazy when she shows up. And we got no problem with a girl whose only claim to fame is being drunk and talking about her sexual, sexually immoral lifestyle. And why do we get, you know, bamboozled by the fact that when we tell the LGBTQ crowd that they're sinful and they need to change their ways. And they're like, you guys just did the exact same thing. Why would you tell us what we're doing is wrong when you do it and you applaud, mm-hmm. applaud it. Mm-hmm. So, yep. um, and I heard Jason Whitlock talk about that this week. And you guys that have been here for a while know how much I really like Jason Whitlock. I think he's generally spot on when it comes to culture. And he wrote an article for, um, The Blaze. And he also, I think, did a podcast talking about this as well. But I'll just read these first two paragraphs here. He says, the only way to defeat the insanity and perversion of the Alphabet Mafia uh, Pride Month is by defeating the insanity and perversion of heterosexual Pride Year. The uncomfortable truth, uh, wait, where is he at? Uh, Yeah, down here. The uncomfortable truth is that Pride parades and drag shows are a mirror for the typical red-blooded American heterosexual. We celebrate, center, and flaunt our sexuality and lust 365 Mm -hmm. days a year. They have Pride Month. We have Pride Year. And man, that is so absolutely true. And it's what makes this Haley ordeal so saddening. Um because it just really highlights the truth that we don't really hate sin. We just hate your sin. Mm -hmm. You know, your sexual deviancy and immorality really bothers me, but mine, I mean, come on, it's not that bad, is it? You know, she's just a young, cute girl who doesn't take herself that serious, but that pride parade, they're a bunch of deviants that want to groom children. Well, what is Zach Bryan bringing her on stage for, right? We're perfectly comfortable with our sin. We see nothing wrong there. Um, You know, Mm. why can't we fight and win a culture war, especially on issues like sexual immorality is because we don't actually want it to end. Truth be told, Mm. we just want to end your sexual immorality, the kind that we don't like. Yeah, ours seems more 
normal. I think that's just the thing is sin, um, perversion, you become desensitized to one thing. That's This is exactly what it is, though. Yeah, Haley is just funny, free yeah. spirit, mm -hmm. but that pride parade, we don't like that LGBTQ kind of sin. That's gross to us. But this one, I mean, come on, you're just having a good time. She's a young girl. Get off her back. Jeez, relax, Yeah, I'm right? sure there's a lot of girls who would have said something similar. They're just trying to be funny and... And maybe I mean, they would, but I mean, she's been interviewed since and... She's leaning into it, you know. Right. The whole thing with not, not a, being ashamed a or kind of a thing. Yeah. So, you know, but certainly shouldn't be promoted. Um, but the you know, the big problem is is kind of what Jason Whitlock pointed out here that the LGBTQ crowd is really just following our lead. You know, we on the heteros uh, heterosexual side, we've been pushing and promoting sexual immorality, a sexually deviant lifestyle since like at least the 60s, right? Kind of the whole summer of love, burn your bras, well, it's make love, not war, not all that, that people stuff. people haven't done those types of things, but it's just being um, celebrated, accepted, pushed to be accepted. Yeah. Probably I mean, since, since the 60s. The 60s. Yeah, yes. I mean, of course, people were, I think, what do they say? You know, prostitution is the oldest profession right. in the world. It's but just the thing with it being pushed to be accepted by society More accepted for sure and you know to me i just see the Haley welch story and you're like it's not really slowing down um we seem to be still fully on board with it so i mean that was kind of my long take and just kind of the thoughts i know you've kind of given them but like what do you make of this whole ordeal with Haley welch i know you were quite reluctant to talk about it i don't know if you see value in talking about it now or is it just kind of well i like the how you brought up to just compare it, how our cultures, the heterosexual, you know, people who hate the pride month are just hypocrites. Um, cause their sin is fine. They're, you yeah, know, I mean, I mean the people who are like teaching. living with their girlfriend or boyfriend and not married, um, you're, just as guilty, you're still setting an example for those who maybe look up to you um, on how how to. I, don't, I mean, there's a lot of Christians who live that way. Oh, for sure, yeah. So, I think it's good to, yeah, just use it as an example, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, we just want to use it as an example again, you know, because you could attach this to a million different areas of life. You know, think about. I actually just had at a 4th of July uh, cookout that we went to with some friends. And he was talking about how, you know, we were talking about like video games or something. And he's like, yeah, you know, I play them, but I'm, you know, trying to be smart about when I do it. Because, you know, when I was a kid and I would go and see my dad and he would just, you know, Saturday and Sunday, he'd wake up and play video games for 14 hours. And when I was a kid and we'd just sit in the house all weekend and he'd have me make bologna sandwiches. And he's like, I kind of resented that. And I was like, yeah, you can't sit in your house and play video games for 13 hours a day and then look at your kid and go, get off those games, they're rotting your brain. But that's what we're doing with Haley Welch, right? So you can apply this to a million different areas where, again, what Christ told us, get the plank out of your own eye. And here we are as heterosexual, traditional value, Christian America, hooting and hollering for Haley Welch while telling the LGBTQ crowd they need to clean up their act. It falls on deaf right. ears. She's, I mean, just kind of like a a mascot. I don't know. <laughs> just this She's person that resembles, I don't, it's the wrong word. I get it. But just so the person cool. that, yeah, represents what the culture wants. Even Christians like this stuff. I mean, so-called Christians, I guess. You can't really, I don't know. I don't know. It's Yeah, it's a... Uh, <laughs> It's bizarre. Yeah, like we hate your sin so much. We're going to rub our sin in your face to prove it's better. All right. <laughs> That's one tactic. Uh, but my big thoughts on this, I had three real takeaways that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, and the first one is kind of mentioned already. I don't really know Zach Bryan, um, but if you do and you like him, this gives me great pause to question his 
really his sincerity and his faith. You know, because my guess, again, just from the outside looking in, is that he brought Haley Welch around to try to take advantage of what she's famous for, right? She's a pretty young girl. She's famous for her nothing other than her bedroom tactics. Like, what other reason would a world famous young man want her around for? She literally provides no value. He's already world famous. He's known across the country music scene. I'm sure he's very well off financially. Like, what can she provide? She's not a singer or a dancer. So why have her around? Uh, He didn't need help selling his music. He didn't need help getting recognition. So I question the motives of Zach Bryan, and I question the motives of anyone else who's going to invite Haley Welch into their sphere. I saw Shaq, uh, Shaquille O'Neal did an interview with her, and I went, what do you right. ask her in her interview? I, Why would you again, my her? thought is it ain't about the interview. It's about the pre or post interview when the cameras aren't on, because I don't know what else value she would. Is she making Shaq more famous? Is she offering some mm-hmm. vital piece of information you can't get elsewhere? Or is she a cute young girl who's famous for bedroom tactics? That's, the, I don't know what else to think when I see this. So My assumption is that all these people that bring her around, they're going to be trying to take advantage of this sort of attractive, sexually promiscuous little country bumpkin. That's the point of it. I could be wrong, you know, but without further evidence, knowing how perverse Hollywood and the whole entertainment industry is, that's my assumption. So unless I hear otherwise... I'm kind of out on Zach Bryan, and I never even got on. It's just funny how people can take anything and make it like a brand or just make it a thing and it becomes known. Like we were just laughing about the 4th of July. Back it up, Terry. Back it up, Terry. He didn't plan to be known. You know, it was just... And I, you got to watch. We'll, we'll have to link the video. Right. That's but funny. like, would you as... But just as an example, people like something and now you can get t-shirts, you know, But we would think this about guy. this, like if Tucker Carlson sat down with the guy who was filming Back It Up, Terry, you'd be like, why would you bring this guy on? What value does he offer? Yeah. Well, he made a funny video that went viral. All right, I suppose, right? Like it wouldn't make any sense. And it's the same yeah. thing with... Haley Welch here. What sense does it make? And it's not even like she's unique in social media stardom. Many people catch lightning in a bottle on social media. So what else is there? Um, That's the first point. The second point is just a reminder of how messed up uh, our culture is that this video would even exist and go viral. Like what would possess a man to walk up to a woman he didn't know and ask her how to please a man on camera. And what would possess a woman to divulge something of that nature on camera so casually? Mm -hmm. Like, in times past, you know, that might have been a put up your dukes kind of moment if somebody walked up and just asked a girl that in broad daylight. I would have punched him in the face. Like, super inappropriate, right? Like, ladies need to know how, if you're a lady, how to react to that. Yeah, like, why would you stick a camera in some person's face you don't know and ask them about their most intimate moments? But how what insulting that is right? that? Like, oh, excuse me, do I look like that kind of girl? Well, maybe she did. I don't know. There was a reason maybe he went up and asked her, or maybe it was just, I don't know. Yeah, so who knows? It says a lot about our culture. And like, in this whole thing, Tim and D, who are the guys, I guess, that have the channel or did the man on the street style interviews. They are part of the problem. They will shoulder some of this uh, burden to bear that falls on Haley Welch. You know, the guys that film this, they're bad guys and they need to repent. Because again, I looked at their channel. This is not the worst stuff that they have on their channels. Uh, And again, I would guess that alcohol played a role in this as well, uh, which is a good reminder. Don't drink. It really doesn't provide any benefit to your life to drink alcohol. It just makes you an idiot, by and large. Um, But, you know, this guy who interviewed her, he's shameful. He should be embarrassed. You know, social media has bred a generation of fools that will say and do anything to get a view or a like online. And what's maybe worse is that 
we know that these people are doing nothing more than creating the dumbest, most offensive, perverse content just to get clicks and views. And we click and view it. And then we claim how stupid it was and how could anybody do it? So we're also part of the problem, right? Getting the plank out of our own eye. Um, we just want the mind numbing, perverse content for a quick chuckle and move along. So they give us the mind numbing, perverse content for our quick chuckle. They make a buck and we have something to shake our fist against, uh, you know, without any real sincerity behind it. And then lastly, um, for those that are promoting Haley Welch, um, because articles have come out that she has now signed a um, an, like a management contract. And these people that are promoting Haley Welch, they are also going to be responsible for the damage that they're going to cause to her life. And I'll start with Zach Bryan. He's responsible. Tim and Dee are bearing responsibility. And so are you out there. And so are we um, for whatever, you know, uh, push we have given her to jump headfirst into this lifestyle she's about to walk into. And um, this article here from outkick.com, it tells, uh, says down here that she's reached a management deal with a, the firm, The Penthouse. Boy, I bet she's going to be in the next, you know, uh, Chronicles of Narnia movie, right? That is that where she's headed for? Unlikely, right? So how do you suppose this is going to end for Haley Welch? Do you think it's going to end with moral purity? You know, she's going to find a godly husband and go raise a bunch of children who love and serve the Lord? Or is it going to likely end with her chasing money and fame by any means necessary, which for her start and where they're leading her means, you know, for an attractive woman who's famous for her sexual promiscuity, it likely just means more debauchery, more sexual immorality until, you know, the entertainment industry or social media kind of gets tired of her and they find the next Haley Welch to uh, put in her place and she's discarded. Like, you know, my thoughts on this was like, what is this management company going to do? I was like, OnlyFans. She's going to wind up on OnlyFans. You know, some make a lot of money, right? And I guess at the end of the day, if that's all that matters, her life will be ruined. This was her, her ticket soul ruined. out of the factory she worked at, I guess. Right, and that's what they'll sell it as. Oh, she was just this country bumpkin living with her grandma, working at a factory. But now she's rich and famous and everybody knows as though that's somehow a positive for her. Nah, oh. she's wrapped up in this deplorable, deviant lifestyle with people taking advantage of her for whatever they can, and her soul's in peril. So the message is, if you don't take yourself too seriously, you could become famous. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's the message they want to send, right? If you're a good-looking girl, why would you go to that community college and fill out a resume, uh, get a camera, take your clothes off? Or, you know, be sexually promiscuous and immoral and you got a shot at some real fame and notoriety there. That's what they're selling them. And all these people are lining up to help sell that message. Um, like, again, I mean, this is a simple country girl, right? Small town. She's just been thrown into the shark infested waters of social media fame, entertainment industry, and she has no preparation for this. She wasn't prepared for this. Her soul's in great peril. And we should not take that lightly. So why is this important to Christians? Uh, well, I think first and foremost, and we shouldn't lose sight of this, uh, a young woman's soul is at stake, and that should matter above all to us. You know, but on a larger scale, we're hypocrites. And that should matter to us too, right? We rail against the LGBTQ movement. And then in the next turn, we laugh off Haley Welch. Or worse, we promote Haley Welch. You know, and we, in the process, destroy our witness and our cultural credibility. You know, the next time Zach Bryan gets on stage and talks about, you know, traditional faith values, I'd be looking at him like, is this the dude that just had Haley Welch on stage? Yeah, Lord knows what he actually did with Haley Welch when they weren't on stage. That's immediately what I'm thinking, right? 
Um, and this is about more than Haley Welch. You know, it's about all the ways in which we sort of give into or accept or promote sexual immorality. You know, again, we talked about the 60s, the whole summer of love and all that nonsense. And, you know, we should be viewing all of that in the same way we view the pride parades. It wasn't some great advancement in feminism. It was sexual deviancy and immorality. And those are grievous sins. You know, we should see like the promotion of Haley by people like Zach Bryant. We should see those in the same light as a drag queen story hour in San Francisco. We should view it in the same light. But do we? I mean, my fear is that we don't. And that's part of the problem. Um, so what should we do about it? You know? I think obviously we should take sin seriously. You know, first you should take the sin in your own life seriously. And then once you actually conquer that or you get that under control, maybe then move on to the cultural issues, right? You're going to rail against the entire pride movement and then, you know, be sexually deviant in your own life. You're not really at the right stage to be tackling that battle there. Um, but, you know, just thinking of this again in light of Pride Month, right? You can't rail against their perversion. And then, you know, like Nikki mentioned, you're kind of having sex out of wedlock. You're a hypocrite. It falls on deaf ears, right? You can't complain against the indecency of these pride parades. And then, you know, you're wearing your skimpy bikini to the beach. There's kids there too, and it's no different. You know, if we want to promote this moral purity and this sort of righteousness, then we need to value and live out moral purity in our own lives and righteousness in our own lives. We can't just demand other people do it while we don't actually, you know, live up to the demands we're making on other people. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Anytime I think we're calling out sin in anyone, we've got to examine our own hearts. Um, because we're probably along that same line somewhere. You know, maybe a little further back, but still, we have right, to examine sure. our own heart and intentions. And that's hard to do. We need to uh, remind each other to do that. Which is why it's important to always mention stuff like this, because we're all perfectly capable of, you know, being blind to whatever we're doing and pointing out the errors in other people, which is why, you know, you should always be listening to good, hard sermons you know, reading good, hard books, reading the Bible to expose and bring to light mm -hmm. all the things that I you're agree. actually doing yeah, and not just, you know, shaking your fist at the world and ignoring all this. So again, we're talking to ourselves here, just like we're talking to everybody else. I think whoever you're around or whatever you're watching, um, cause we always compare ourselves to others. So say you spend your time really looking, I don't know, you follow you know, godly people online um, versus the ungodly. And so you're going to compare yourself with how they're living. So, you know, if you socialize with very godly people, <laughs> you will probably end up just naturally feeling convicted, comparing your life to theirs. Whereas you hang out with worldly, ungodly people, you probably won't have a conviction because you'll be seeing their lifestyle, their sin in comparison to yours, and you're more likely to be pointing the finger at theirs, but not seeing your own, if that makes sense. Whoever we hang out with, it's kind of like we're either going to point the finger or we're going to feel convicted if someone yeah. else is living a more righteous life than we are. Um, so maybe like we're kind of desensitized. Our, even the Christian culture can become desensitized as you know, we're so just, I mean, through social media, we hear about these things um, just in the news or whoever you follow, and you just start feeling like secure where you're at because you're like, look at how wicked everyone else is or, and you feel okay. Yeah. We don't want to do, I mean, just considering that in our own lives, because again, we're not pointing the fingers at everyone else and forgetting ourselves. You know, we went and watched the movie Horizon. Um just yesterday. And we didn't know what it was. We just were going to go with some friends and well, and it was just like a Western, just a Western. <laughs> and, you know, so we went and watched it and, you know, there was a completely inappropriate, had no business being in the movie, didn't advance the plot at all, nude scene in the movie. And, you know, we did our best to 
turn our eyes away and stuff. But then, you know, there's still the guilt of sitting there and like, why am I here? Like, why would I not look in advance to know if there was something I shouldn't have seen here? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's something that needs to be repented of. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't uh, matter. Like, you can't just go, well, yeah, but I mean, I didn't know. So like, it's no big deal. No, it that's is the thing because we like movies. Um, we do like to try to find a good movie to watch with the kids and it's hard and you can't, I mean, no, we got VidAngel and stuff like that today, stuff to kind of like cut that out. But yeah, we um, we can't say, oh, but it's a good movie. So we tolerate it. Like I do feel convicted over that. But we just yeah, and that's just you know a one-off <laughs> thing. And you know, if you care to know about the rest of the movie, let me know in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer. <laughs> yeah. But this is just the whole point, right? Like, yeah, we want to not just ignore what we're doing. We should kind of see ourselves. You know, it's like a link in the chain, like you were saying. We should be looking to the godly mm. to sort of pull us up higher, and at the same time, we don't want to remove ourselves from the world. We want to be in the world so that we can grab others and pull them up higher with us as well, right? We don't want to let them drag us down, but we don't want to leave them in their own, you know, muck and mire either. So it would kind of be like, we got to be a link in the chain as we all drag each other higher should be how we sort of Mm -hmm. view it. Um, But how should we pray about this? Um, Because Christians should be praying about everything. And I think, you know, first off, we should be praying for Haley Welch. Even if we don't know her, we should be praying for her because she's headed, in my opinion, for a world of abuse. And yeah. we need to pray that she's God would protect of. her. Yeah. Like, yep, she's going to make money in the process. But I would just assume that the plans that this world has for her are not going to be good. So pray that she comes to her senses. Pray that somebody gets in her ear or around her, some godly people, and they can speak the truth to her. Because I would assume you don't walk this road if the spirit dwells within you. So she is in need of salvation desperately. Um, But then pray for yourselves also, uh, as we're going to be praying for ourselves, that we don't just say the right words, but that we actually desire to live in the right ways, which is righteously. And, um, you know, reject even our own sin that's comfortable and, you know, normal to us while we shake our fist at other people's sins. We don't want to be those kind of people. We want to be righteous. We want to strive after righteousness. So pray for Haley, pray for Nikki and I, pray for yourselves. Um, But yeah, I think she's in some great peril. So No, it's sad. She's a young girl. Like she's just, just 23. Yeah. That's young. It's real young. It's crazy. Um, But do you have any final thoughts on Haley Welch before we move this thing along? Um, not really anything new. Okay. Uh, shame on you, Zach Bryan. That's how I'll end it there. But um, we'll move this thing along and get into our next story on God AI. Uh, But before we get there, if you're enjoying the show, please take a second to drop a like, um, subscribe or follow if you're on YouTube or Rumble. If you're on the podcast, thank you very much for listening on the podcast. Please take a second to follow or subscribe if your platform allows it and maybe leave us a five-star review. Those things would certainly help. And if you want to leave us a comment, most of these stories that we talk about, I'm kind of looking for feedback. You know, I only know what I know and think what I think. And I like to hear other people's opinions, even if I don't agree with you on all of them. So respond in the comments with what you think. I'll do my best to read them all and reply to them all. I can't promise I'll get the replies on on all of them, but I do read them and I do appreciate them all. So um, please consider doing that. It would bless us mightily. All right. Uh, AI. It's here to make our lives better, we're told. So much better in every way. Or is it here to rule over us and serve as our new God and subject us to the matrix? Well, let's go ahead and get Mark Zuckerberg's thoughts on AI. Do you want to read this headline? Zuckerberg says AI rivals are trying to create God amid new technological breakthroughs. Um, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg recently took aim at AI rivals for creating God. During a recent interview with YouTuber Kane Sutter, he went on to say, 
I find it a pretty big turnoff when people in the tech industry talk about building this one true AI. Uh, Zuckerberg appeared to be alluding to some in Silicon Valley who fancy the idea of building a technology that could surpass the general intelligence of human beings. It's almost as if they kind of think they're creating God or something, and it's just, that's not what we're doing. I don't think that's how this plays out, Zuckerberg said. Well... I certainly think that's what they're doing or what they're trying to do. And my views on the matter have not really changed since we started this podcast. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I believe that if we had full on like God AI, as Zuckerberg calls it, I do think people would worship it mm -hmm. as God. Oh, yeah. You know, like we already allow technology to be our masters and we're slaves to our technology, like making it a God in worshiping it doesn't seem like it's terribly far away at this point. Mm -hmm. And especially once they get like this general AI and they can create AI that's like a hundred times smarter than us. Why wouldn't we worship it? Um, mm -hmm. This article goes on down here and it says uh, futurism, which I guess some other magazine or website, or I'm not sure reported that Zuckerberg contends that an AI god would essentially be unrealistic because people have different needs and interests. To sufficiently tend to all of those needs and interests, there will be a need for several different forms of artificial intelligence. Hmm. Now, here I would um, agree with him in a sense, but I don't think the big players in AI would agree with him, and that's the problem. Because I don't think it's about tending to the needs and interests of all these disparate groups. Uh, I think it's about those in charge determining what are the appropriate needs and interests to have and then forcing everyone else into their worldviews. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it's going to be more likely to go. And I think this is where Zuckerberg's being dishonest. Because, um, I mean, at this point, if you're kind of a big tech or one of these, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs, you're basically a politician, which means we can't take what you say seriously um, to a great extent because he was, and I'm assuming probably still is guilty of all of this, basically, you know, uh, and we've seen an abundance of this over the years with most of these large tech companies kind of deciding either with or without the government's help, what's acceptable discourse and what isn't right. Mm -hmm. They're kind of shaping the discourse in this nation. And this is even without general AI. This is just like simple social media algorithms. So even already, they're not concerned with tending to the needs of many groups. I think I remember when, I think it was Parler. That was kind of the first big-ish sort of Twitter rival that was supposed to be like all free speech. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, you know, Twitter or uh, parlor, you know, everything has to run on Google. And it was like the entire website was taken down. Mm -hmm. Like you just couldn't even log into it yeah. um, for a yeah. time. And it was just not allowed to talk there. Sorry. Um, we all know what the Twitter files exposed and what happened to Facebook during all the elections and stuff like that. They were, they were already doing this. They weren't tending to all the various needs if you didn't think right, you were a kook, you were a conspiracy theorist, and you got silenced on social media. You weren't allowed to say those things. So they already, you know, silenced a the speech they don't like, and they amplify the speech they do like, which is why it seems like this LGBTQ pride stuff seems to be so big and everywhere. It's because those are the companies that are amplifying the message. Yeah. You know, so I don't know why more powerful AI in their hands would change that tactic. This is the thing how how people think is what they hear about or see in the news the most. They assume that is the majority's um, oh, yeah. opinions or beliefs, and I don't think it is really. I don't think it no. is as much as they want you to think it is because people don't like to be. Um, to go off on their own and stand out, eat, you know, even if they're alone in the truth, people are uncomfortable with that. They'd rather go with the crowd, so they'll go with whatever the media is putting out as the majority when, in fact, it isn't. 
So you have yeah. to remember that. <laughs> and it's hard. I mean, Google's ruined the internet. So it's not like you can even really, if you're not like great at research to really go and defend your own opinions against a lot of this stuff. You know, these big tech companies have made it difficult to not get the pre-approved narratives, you know, um, pushed down your, you know, pushed into your brain. So, I mean, it's a challenge, right? So I don't think it's really about tending to these specific groups. I think it's about whichever group gains the advantage in the AI sort of like arms race. Oh, yeah. Because they'll be the ones that are asserting sort of their worldview on the rest. And um, I think it's a really fascinating arena, you know, because everyone is aware, right? We're listening to Mark Zuckerberg here. Everyone is aware of the dangers and the risks that are involved. They talk about the risks all the time. And then they just plow ahead anyways. You know, they all list yep. the, the risk. I have this other article here. Um, tech giants like Google and Meta are admitting AI could actually hurt their businesses. You know, this is just about their business, but it says down here um, in its 2023 annual, annual report, Google's parent company, Alphabet, said its AI products and services raise ethical technological, legal, regulatory, and other challenges, which may negatively affect our brands and demand. Uh, so have they slowed down? Nope. And then it says down here, uh, Microsoft said their generative AI features may be susceptible to unanticipated security threats from sophisticated adversaries. There are significant risks involved in developing and deploying AI, and there can be no assurance that the usage of AI will enhance our products or services or be beneficial in our, uh, to our businesses, including our uh, efficiency or profitability. So have they slowed down? No. And, uh, and even included with all of this, you know, so there's the big tech companies, but the public, we the people, we've all been vocal about our concerns with AI. You know, people have been talking about AI making jobs obsolete. You know, um, I think in this article, it even talks about like large language models on personal data and sort of the fear that that can spread misinformation. You know, so have the government slowed down AI? Nope, just plowing straight ahead. Like everyone sees the risks, but it's like that arrogance of man just convinces them that you know what? They can get control of the problem. Mm -hmm. They can forecast all the problems and they can corral it and they can utilize it for good overall. They can iron out all the flaws. Um, and I think we do this too. I mean, I know I do this too. I talk to you guys constantly about how much I hate AI, but I like tech and I find myself in that weird position, right? And um, so we all deal with this stuff. Uh, let me see. I think I had one more paragraph in here. Oh, I think it was from this other article. Let me read it. Yeah, this is from Zuckerberg again. That Zuckerberg art article. It says, however, it's still uncertain how AI will affect, or AGI, artificial general intelligence, will affect the world if it actually manifests. Shane Legg, the chief AGI scientist at Google DeepMind, said that there's around a 50% chance that AGI will be a reality by 2028. But not everyone holds the same amount of optimism about the technology as leg. So that's less than four years away. <laughs> now, I wouldn't be super surprised by that. You know, there used to be a term in sort of the computing semiconductor sort of world, Moore's Law, you know, that I can't remember exactly what it means, but kind of like the rate of advancement dub or doubles every two years or something like that. Mm that law is dead, right? Like we're just, we're just speeding ahead. Technology's advancing faster and faster, it seems. And no one's really looking to slow it down is what it appears to be. But obviously I talk about this a lot. I think we should be concerned about this and we should speak out about this and we should look to disconnect our lives from it as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Um, like we already know that social media has a negative effect on people's mental states. Yeah. You know, sort of like this feelings of inadequacy, the hatred and anger that gets stoked. We've talked a lot about the social contagion phenomenon with the whole like 
uh, gender dysphoria and gender confusion among the youth. Mm -hmm. That's a real thing. Um, and again, this article talks about AI jobs that are going to take jobs from real people. Mm -hmm. uh, like these aren't good things in my opinion, and we shouldn't just accept them. Like, well, I guess by 2028, we're all going to be Wally living on government paychecks just so we can get our basic oh needs goodness. for life. And that's somehow supposed to be like, boy, the future looks bright. The future is when I look, when I think of the future, I think of how lazy people are going to be. I mean, physically and mentally, like people already don't like to think for themselves. They don't like to critically think. They just want the so-called professionals to do all the critical thinking for them. They just want to sit back and trust those and authority and be spoon fed false information and just live in a delusion. Yeah, that seems to be where we want to be heading. That's what people want. You guys want to go to Broadway and watch Shakespeare? Or do you want to listen to Haley Welch on the Shack podcast and then play Call of Duty? You're like, but that's easy people's choice, goals. Right? I think like I would rather make money for something stupid and not contribute to society at all than have a factory job. Like having a job is just that's something to be proud of, even if it's not, people don't admire it, you know? Used to admire it. The whole working hard and taking care of a family used to be an admirable thing. But, you know, I don't think we have to just accept that future. And I do think, you know, one of the encouraging things that I've seen over the last few years, um, kind of at the same time that this AI slave generation is rising, I think we're also sort of seeing a rise in this kind of like trad wife, this like trad life, whatever you want to call it, generation. Um, you know, the you've probably seen them on social media. The trad wife was kind of a big thing. Stay at home, bacon, raising kids, farming kind of became a thing. And mm -hmm. now I think both of those are extremes in a sense, maybe. But I think extremes can be good. It's funny you say, like, the trad wife thing's extreme. Okay, it just made me think of this um, thing someone shared. Um, and the girl in this video was saying, uh, she was just, just pointing out, just, you know, just trying to live like people going that way, just wanting to live on their own and just be self-sufficient. So she brought up the whole thing. She's like, people who just want to be like, be barefoot outside. The, we, we call that grounding now. No, it just used to be the way people lived, like just barefoot outside yeah. all the time. Like you're a weird, crunchy hippie if you do that. Like you're extreme. Or if you, what was the other one she brought up? Or if you just want to like eat natural food, you are laughed at. Like you're extreme for trying to find food that's just, Real ingredients. Yeah. Like that's an extreme way you to read live. The ingredients list at the grocery store, you're crazy. You're like, am I? Yeah, but just al um, al along those lines, just yeah. wanting to go back to the way things were meant to be, but you're labeled as like wanting to be Amish or something. Right. When and really, I, that's normal. That's not extreme. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily an extreme. I think it can be an extreme, but it's viewed as an extreme regardless of what I think. Um, but I don't think that's bad. You know, because I view sort of the AI slave generation as extreme. You know, you're walking around and you're like Apple Vision Pro goggles and that's extreme to me. You know, so they look it's at weird. walking around in grass eating organic carrots is extreme. Either way, I think they're good because I think they're a way to balance us. We need the extremes. They sort of, because, you know, there's always the extremes on both ends and then most people find their balance in the middle somewhere. And... I think it's good to see a large number number of people turning away from this like overly tech based society that we find ourselves in and just returning to that like simpler, mm -hmm. more traditional lifestyle. Well, we all if you have kids who like to be on screens, you you admit they are happier, they're better behaved when they are not on screens for the day. It affects adults too. Very oh, much so, but I have heard everybody say that about their kids. 
They are just in a better mood when they're outside or they're doing something that's not on a screen. It really does. It causes depression and stress and anxiety. You're more irritable. Um, It affects all of us. It affects your mental health and your relationship with other people in a very negative way. It does. Um, But I think it's, and I think it's good because we are seeing a lot of people turn away from that and kind of, you know, I think at least recognizing that you don't have to be a complete slave or subservient to this like technocracy that we're walking into. Um, and we just talked about this a couple of weeks ago that I'm not convinced that all the benefits of sort of modern society, the, all the benefits it offers us are really benefits. You know, like, yeah, we live longer. We have more stuff, more money, the medical advancements. We've got this like, um, worldwide kind of connectedness, but where has it led us all? Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, at least in the West, right? It's led us away from God. It's led us away from relying on God. Anybody even say their life has improved? I think everybody just agrees. Life was better before all the technology we have, especially just like the social media aspect. And there's a tipping point, right? Because like Modern medical advancement is nice. I appreciate having Tylenol yeah. when I pull a muscle in my back. But then we read the stories where to extend someone's life, they're getting a pig's heart put in their body. And you're like, that's not good. Um, you know, like there's a tipping point. And, you know, anything at the end of the day that's going to lead you away from relying on God and where you put all your faith and trust in things like money and technology, those aren't benefits for your life. Um, you know, like we have this worldwide connectedness, we're more connected, but we're less relational. Mm -hmm. That's not good. Yeah. Uh, It's like we're living longer, but we're chronically ill. We're chronically ill. Mm -hmm. You know, we have hundreds, thousands of friends on social media and we never see anybody in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a um, very shallow life socially. All these kids are like like, (laughs) combat warriors on PlayStation and they're fat and dumpy in real life because they never get off their butt, right? Like these aren't benefits at the end of the day. Um, so I'm going to keep beating my, uh, drum that AI is a problem Mm -hmm. and it will become more of a problem, but we don't have to succumb to it. Oh, another example would be the churches where they think the numbers is success when they're really dying spiritually. (laughs) Yeah. And that's just the whole (laughs) Church growth equals church yeah. success. We talked about maybe a year ago, you know, who was it? T.D. Jake's daughter who had like a 10,000 member church and closed the whole church down just to go online. They got a better presence online. So we'll just be an online church. Well, yeah. you're not a church. If everything's about numbers, then yeah. You're a content creator. That's all you are. And that's not bad. Be- well, I guess if she's your pastor at the end of the day, closing the church doors was probably a benefit for everybody. But the idea is not a benefit, right? Tech has not improved, you know, because that's one thing they'll always say, like, you know, the dangers of technology, but hey, you know, it's helped the church. We can spread the gospel. Like, yeah, the gospel was spreading just fine, you know, before social media and the internet became our all in all and our everything. So, and, yeah. And we've talked about it before where so many people today, see themselves as introverts or they don't like to be very social, they get anxiety. I think this has um, caused that in a sense. It is funny how many people are like, they wear introvert as a badge of honor. Right, yeah. I'm really introverted. There's Facebook groups for it. Somebody invited me to it. Like, like, but they have like funny memes about not wanting to be around people. And I'm just like, yeah. I, that's not me. I, I like being around people, not everyone, but come on. That's, that's not the attitude mindset we should have. No, it's not the mindset you should have. Even if you don't enjoy it, you can recognize it's good and you can go and do it. And, um, but so I think that's something we should be thinking about. We don't have to succumb to it. You know, in your own life, you can begin to disconnect at some level And I think even in your business, you can begin to disconnect because that's one of the major pushes for AI is in the business world. You know, it's going to be more efficient. It can raise your revenues and all this sort of stuff. But do we also have to be slaves to money at the expense of real people? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think we have to. Now, certainly don't have all the answers to this, of course. um, But I think 
one of the other big problems with this AI, you know, train that we're on is that so much of this, you know, stuff around AI, you always hear it. People is just like, they're resigned to it. You know, yeah, it stinks. It's going to be bad, but that's where we're headed. You can't stop it. Right. That's kind of like the idea. And that's not a good idea. Like who says that has to be your mindset? Uh, Cause again, I don't think it's given us a better world. It might be a more comfortable world, but what makes more comfortable better, you know? Uh, so I just think kind of like shining a light on this, highlighting its dangers, encouraging people to pull back. It's kind of the best way I know how to do, uh, or the best thing I know how to do right now. So I'm just going to keep doing it. Uh, cause again, everyone sees the dangers, but they're just unwilling to stop, which is bizarre. You know, and that maybe it's not bizarre because it kind of sounds like every sin that you've ever really given into in your life, any sin that's ever gripped man, you know, we all know the dangers Mm -hmm. in our heart of hearts. We all know that that porn on a computer screen isn't really going to satisfy you. It will momentarily, and then it'll be back. Right. And it's probably going to get more and more deviant as you go, you know, so why would this lust for AI be any different? So you know, maybe go hire a real person at your business, uh, go visit a real friend in real life, maybe read a real book with paper, you know, take your shoes off and work in a real garden from time to time, and maybe even worship the one true God. Hmm. Those are all things that you can do to improve your life. I think that's kind of the real recipe for happiness and success in life. But do you have any final thoughts on God AI or AI in general, or being one of those kooky, barefoot, organic food eaten. Well, just save the other thoughts because we'll know what's going to come up again. This topic is something on my sock. Anywho, that's not part of this episode. But I just want to say again don't be quiet about your concerns here with AI. This is the lesson that I kind of learned myself over this week when I was thinking about this story. Like, don't stop sounding the alarm about this to the people that you know, which is what I'm trying to do, because I don't think we're the kooky ones. I don't think we're the crotchety old people either, you know, who just don't get it, right? I think we're probably right. And I think if you feel this way, you're probably right as well. You know, I think one of the things that we've kind of noticed as we've gotten older is that people generally wake up to sort of biblical truths about the world in their own time. Even if they don't call it biblical truth, even if they don't acknowledge God, they wake up to the biblical truth because it's reality. Like if you just look at Richard Dawkins, right, the famous atheist, he's waking up to the biblical truth that, yeah, you know what, a Christian world is a better place to live. Mm -hmm. Even if he doesn't want to hat tip God, doesn't want to, he's recognizing it. And I think most people do. So I think the worst thing we can do is stop talking about it, stop warning people, because Mm -hmm. then they won't actually hear the truth. You know, comfort isn't always better. Profit isn't always preferable. And like, as we're seeing, artificial is not always superior. So those are my final thoughts. Keep talking about it, you crazy old kooks. Take your shoes off and go walk in the grass. Maybe not New Mexico. Bit by a red hand and then remember why shoes were. We have red ants and goat heads. But I do walk in the grass in our backyard because I planted grass. There are no goat heads and there are no ants. And I do walk in it barefoot every day. Our little tiny plot we have. Just touching the grass to stay normal. Feels (laughs) good. All right. Uh, One last story, though, to get to before we end with our Reddit Christianity question of the week. Uh, We want to speak about homelessness. But before we get there, just a quick reminder, we are proud members of the Christian podcast community. Great place to go find uh, 50 to 60 sort of indie-ish Christian podcasts covering a whole range of topics from apologetics, uh, you know, street talk theology, uh, just all sorts of stuff, movie reviews, finances, homeschooling, parenting, Whatever you're into, they have it on there from a Christian perspective, and I'm sure you'll be blessed. I'll have links down in the show notes. You can go check that out. So 
Do you want to read this headline as we dive into our discussion on homelessness? Sure. All right. Leftists wail as New Hampshire City addresses homelessness problem just days after landmark uh, Scottish ruling. Um, the largest city in New Hampshire has already begun to clean up its streets just days after the U.S. Supreme Court issued a Pivotal ruling likely to have a significant impact on the country's growing homelessness problem. While much of the focus on homelessness has been on California and other West Coast states, Manchester, New Hampshire has had a major homelessness problem of its own in recent years. Perhaps as many as 140 Manchester residents are homeless and another 400 or so are living in shelters, the city website said. Yep. So this article jumped out to me because we live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, which is a city suffering badly because of homelessness. And, and it's not just homelessness. It's, it's a, well, I guess they're homeless because of, you know. Right. It's not. It's a drug you know, problem. They're not just unemployed. That creates homelessness. For sure. Right. Um, so I went and looked up the exact numbers as best I could find them in Albuquerque. And I found this article. 2,394 people experiencing homelessness in Albuquerque, 83% increase from 2022. So this article came out in 2023. So nearly doubled in one year. Oh my God. And the article says here, end homelessness, which I guess is this group, shows there are now 2,394 people experiencing homelessness, a nearly 83% increase. And then they talk about the survey they did, it says out of 252 people interviewed, 14 said they were from countries like Cuba, El Salvador, Mexico, and Panama. And the survey acknowledged that the overall numbers are an undercount as more than 700 people <laughs> reportedly refuse to answer. So 700 people are afraid to say where they are from. Or maybe even if they're actually even homeless. I mean, who knows what that, you know... You go and talk to some dude on a tent that doesn't speak English, and you're like, hey, are you homeless? Where are you from? And you're like, no. Okay, well. Now, this isn't kind of saying that Albuquerque is in any way unique. This problem is not unique to us. Uh, it's a widespread issue across our nation. But apparently it looks like our Supreme Court, this ruling, um, might be bringing some change to this situation as it talks about here with the city of Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, in this article, it says, last Friday, SCOTUS judge, uh, justices ruled six to three that cities can ban sleeping and camping in public areas such as streets and parks. And then by Tuesday evening, Manchester leaders have already voted to change the city's local ordinances to make public areas safer. Which... The first thing that stood out to me was like, why in the world would it require a Supreme Court involvement mm -hmm. to allow cities to keep their streets and public areas safe and clear of homelessness? How broken can this country be when the mayor can't even go, uh, I don't want homeless tent encampments in front of people's houses. Well, take it to the Supreme Court, sir. That doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it's so bad here that they're just, they're really, they're in neighborhoods. They're at the entrance to like every restaurant and store, like oh, yeah. literally, not Businesses kidding. Like get shut down. I go, of it. if I go to Walmart, like that area, uh, there's a Walmart, there's a Ross, there's a PetSmart, like I go there often. There's, I'm always walking by like a sleeping homeless person every time I go, every yeah. single time I go. And those I'm are the ones that are someone like. someone laying there. Those are the ones that are just like sparsely littered. Yeah, that's not people. even that bad. I mean, there's certain yeah. streets here where businesses have had to close because they just can't get business in the doors because the homelessness is so bad around. And these are like in prime. Even our church has to. Deal with what? that. You guys don't go to church with bullet holes in the windows. <laughs> I mean, Our church used to be a on? bank. <laughs> so I just want to read a few more paragraphs from this story here. It says, 
on Tuesday, Mayor Jay Ru- Ruas, um, Quit Ruas, trying. Yeah, I'm just going to stop. <laughs> and the city's aldermen met and voted overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly 14 to 1 to ban public camping entirely, effective immediately. This measure gives the police uh, the option to impose a $250 fine on violators, and the city also allotted police an extra $500,000 to help with enforcement. Despite the apparent enthusiasm for the new ordinance from local leaders, some residents spoke out against it during the public uh, comment portion of the meeting, often echoing tired platitudes these critics express deep sympathy for the homeless population, but seemingly little concern for area families, saying, we cannot arrest our way out of homelessness. And then one woman said, unhoused people need homes, not handcuffs. Now, of course, this is a conservative website, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but... It's not just that they're homeless, it's what they're doing. Like, you're going to the bathroom on someone else's property... A business. The public is gonna oh, walk there. To me, Mickey. Somehow you leave your needles behind. Taking dumps on the sidewalk. Not just and homeless. A problem. Like uh, when you're camp. So if you go camping, are you doing that when you go camping? Are you leaving needles and you don't leave your, your feces laying around where you sleep, where other people are gonna walk? Like this, you can't even call this public camping because people don't do this when they're camping. Right. I mean, this is all. Again, this is the liberal mindset. Let's argue about sort of the uh, the symptoms of the disease rather than the actual cause of the disease. You know, we have to allow homeless people to camp on the streets or else it's inhumane. And I like, like seeing... Why don't we take care of the homeless people and the get comments. them off the streets? Right. No. But that's why I go to the comments. I love to see what people just say, the obvious. Like, okay, why don't you go... T- Grab a few homeless people off the street and let them live with you. You have such compassion for them. They're just homeless. Well, Bring we them saw in. how that worked out when all the governors of the southern states were flying the illegal immigrants to like Martha's Vineyard and uh, those <laughs> other places, and they all lost their mind, right? But I did laugh about this a little bit because if nothing else, the left is clever with their words. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not pedophilia anymore. It's minor attracted person. And then, you know, it's not men or women, they're birthing people. It's not genital mutilation, it's gender affirmation surgery. And now here, it's not homelessness, they're unhoused people, right? They just need a house. I mean, yeah, they're just unhoused, give here, them a house. Around here, they're just getting their money. People give them their money and they're using them for drugs or they're, they're taking over the, some hotels and some, I think, some apartments too. They're just... Yeah, I mean, listen, you... You know, lower middle class husband and wife who can barely make it. You go and buy a house you can't afford in a neighborhood that won't keep you safe. But those unhoused people, they just need a house given to them. I don't see why you see a problem with that. You buy a house you can't afford because we've destroyed the economy. And we're going to give the homeless person who doesn't contribute a free house. Why is that a problem? I don't understand it. So, uh, but they're clever with their words nonetheless. But Again, want this to be more of a question rather than just me making blanket statements that I could be wrong on. How should Christians view the homeless, you know, basically homeless crisis in this nation? And is this law sort of, or this ruling from the Supreme Court, good or bad from the Christian perspective, the Christian point of view? You know, should we be like bringing in large numbers through mass migration when we can't even house or provide for the people we have here already? Or, you know, should we be like doing more for them where they are so that they can stay in countries like El Salvador? Or should we be doing neither and be like, let's take care of our own country and they can take Mm -hmm. care of their own country. Um, Because we actually did just talk about this again with our friends on the 4th of July. You know, we had some friends there that were in social work for many years. And they were certainly for this uh, ruling by the Supreme Court. You know, what they had to say about the homelessness problem was basically what you were saying and what a lot of people say, that this is mostly by their choice. And they mostly aren't looking to leave, even when you can provide ways for people to get off the street. And they don't want to. They're in the streets because they want to be in the streets. 
And mostly they're there because of drugs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something they don't want to give up either. Or they can't or whatever it is. But, like, they want the drugs. They want to stay on the street. They're not looking to leave. You know, so are Christians, and there are Christians, you know, that, you know, feel differently about this. But for Nikki and I, we're certainly on board with this, I believe. And we really hope that a ruling like this can help clean up Albuquerque, our streets here in the town we live in. I mean, because there are certain parts of this city that are not only dangerous because of the homelessness, you know, and the drug abuse mm-hmm. and stuff like that that Nikki talked about. But they've effectively shut down like legitimate business in these areas that are um, commercial uh, parts of town. And they've just shut down the ability to do real business there. Mm -hmm. They've damaged residential areas because they're just kind of overrun in these areas. You know, we've had tent cities in Albuquerque and they go and clean out the tent cities and they don't leave. They just move to different parts of the city and stay in their tents. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got streets here that are lined in tents, you know, certain streets at night, like heaven forbid, you know, your car breaks down and your wife's driving alone or something. During the day, I got rerouted um, soon after we moved here. I don't know where I was trying to go, but yeah, it took me right through just what should have been just a normal neighborhood. And I felt like I was not in Albuquerque. I was like, where am I? I'm, I'm in so Los afraid. Angeles. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's like with, a third world country almost, it seems like. And, you know, and that's just in addition to all of the, you know, every street corner's got homeless people on them asking for money. So what do we do? You know, I'll tell you just for me, and I, I'm guessing I can speak for Nikki as well. Like, we're definitely in favor of this ruling. And we're definitely in favor of states and cities like Manchester, New Hampshire, deciding to get people off their streets and out of their parks. You know, again, speaking with our kind of social worker friends, you know, they made the point like, at least in Albuquerque, there is certainly enough private and public services that are provided to these people that Mm -hmm. they don't have to be homeless if they don't want to be. So it's a choice that they're making. And, you know, I'm a firm believer because it's biblical in 2 Thessalonians, what is it, verse uh, through chapter 3, verse 10, if anyone's not willing to work, neither let him eat. Mm-hmm. I'm a believer in that because it's biblical. Now, you could say that they're working by standing on the corner asking for money. Maybe that's your the way you define work there, but I don't consider that work. No, that's not work. No, that's that's just asking for a handout. That's right. not working. You're not benefiting. You're not contributing. You know, I'm helping to help you anybody feel else. good about yourself. Um, don't ask me what I'm spending the money on. Just give it to me anyways. But, you know, how should Christians view this problem? You know, and what should we what should we be doing about it in our cities? Because, like, when we first moved here, we went to a church, and they were talking about the different groups and things they had. And they had one that was a homeless outreach ministry. And I kind of thought about getting involved in it. We stuck around that church. I thought, man, that'd be kind of good. And But I started having second thoughts about it because, you know, I don't know how many churches we have in this city, but if you've got like a hundred churches in this city and they all have a homeless outreach, they're all providing, you know, free food, uh, clothing, other services and stuff like that for these homeless people, then are we just enabling them to continue in this lifestyle? Um, I mean, you, know, you go into me... these neighborhoods though, and it's littered with clothes. You go under any highway bridge, there's clothes sprawled everywhere. Like they're not, needing clothes. None of them need clothes. Right. And that's kind of what the social worker friends we have are saying. Like there's the, the public sector services that are being provided and money and opportunity. And then there's the private business. And then there's the churches and the nonprofit organizations. And like, there's a lot being done. So it's like, are we just enabling, Mm -hmm. you know, because part of me says that yes, Um, And therefore, if we're enabling these people because we're providing so much food and, you know, services and clothing and all these different things to make it super easy for them to just stay on the streets, then I'm not sure we're really providing positively to the communities that we're in. Mm. But then the other part of me says, no, you know, like 
we as Christians should just do what's right and then just let God sort out the details. So I don't really know which part of that is right or if they're well, both if, right, if the blend. I mean, I'm not sure. If anyone's ever had a friend or family member who's been addicted to anything, if that's gambling or if that's drugs or alcohol, you know that when you give them money, you know, you know, you know what they're spending it on. Um, and these are the kinds of people that end up on the streets. Um, I have family, or I've had family who's been on the streets. I have, well, I have a family member now who's not homeless, but kind of a wanderer, doesn't have a car, doesn't want to have a car, doesn't want to drive, just kind of a wandering person, kind of not all there in the head. Um, not a person I would give money to. They're a family member, but I wouldn't, I don't think I would, I'm, I would be enabling. They have no desire to change. Um, you kind of want people to hit rock bottom and even rock bottom here in Albuquerque <laughs> isn't that bad, obviously, because they enjoy the rock bottom because they get all the handouts. Um, right. And that's the big problem with part of the homelessness is you don't know who's the really desperate and who isn't. Yeah, you don't know. You know so who's just taking advantage of it? Who wants but to be there? That's why there's really... those other programs out there. If right. they really those want help, good. they can go to them. The ones that just stay in the streets. And, I mean, you can tell they're on drugs. You can tell they're walking right into the road. They're they're all, like so many of them are yelling at people who walk by or they'll see somebody off in the distance, like at another crosswalk. And they're yelling at them. They're just, someone's just walking. And they're like, in their head, you can tell they think that that person is saying something to them and they're arguing with them. And that person like has no clue that that person's standing there yelling at them. They're really, they're crazy. Or they're just on drugs. So they're acting, they're well, not in the right mind. That part about the craziness is certainly a factor. You know, you read that comment or article about a lot of these people should be in mental um, health hospitals or something, but so yeah. many of those is cl have closed. And we talked about this with RFK Jr. He brought this up a long time ago that so many mental health hospitals have closed and a lot of these people that should be getting professional help, they're just kind of out on the streets or in jail because there's nowhere to put them. So you know, you have people that have mental health problems, which is certainly serious, but then they're doing drugs and like, it's a bad situation. And I thought even with that, you add in sort of like the illegal immigration that we're dealing mm -hmm. with in this nation. I feel like, you know, cause we're spending a lot of money in this city and churches are devoting a lot of their tithe money and private businesses are devoting a lot of money. Like once we sort of illegal immigrate ourselves into oblivion, mm -hmm. um, we're no longer going to be able to help anyone. You know, I thought of it almost like having a national policy of, you know, trying to, if you're, you know, your aircraft has a problem, make sure you put the mask on uh, the other person first before you take care of yourself. Yeah. And like, you're just going to wind up having, you know, you're going to die and then you can't take care of anybody else. And it's like, is that where we're going? If we just continue to enable these sorts of lifestyles and behaviors, is that really godly to enable that in people? Or are you being ungodly because you don't have compassion on people like, and empathy? So. What would all these churches do if they didn't, if we didn't have the homeless people, you know, you think you're helping them because you're being nice to them. That's all they're doing. They're just being nice. <laughs> well, like, what would they do? What would your outreach be? Yeah. I mean, who I mean, knows what they would be doing or, you know, cause like that article said, 83% increase in one year. It and can't how just many be a, years? an economic downturn. And all these churches helping the homeless. Why the increase? Are they helping? Should be a decrease, shouldn't it? You would assume. So, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I would like to see Albuquerque cleaned up because it can be a beautiful city. It can be a vibrant city, you know, I think. But in its current state, like, at times it can be hard to see the beauty in this city here. Um, and I also don't think that it's right or moral to just sort of let people live off other people while they waste away. I think mm -hmm. that's immoral. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's immoral for our governments to sort of 
take our tax dollars and pay it out to people who won't work by choice. I don't think that's right, but I could be missing something. So am I missing something? Let me know. Uh, This is definitely something I'd like to get some feedback on. So uh, let us know in the comments what you think about this ruling. How do we handle homelessness? Have you seen things in your cities that have worked or haven't worked? Uh, Because whatever Albuquerque's doing, it's not working. Um, But do you, honey, have any final thoughts on this Supreme Court ruling dealing with homelessness? Nope. I think it's good. You know, Mm -hmm. we've been a little bit rocky on the Supreme Court here, you know, but they've had a couple of good rulings, a couple bad rulings, which maybe that's what you want from a Supreme Court. You want them to kind of not be playing for one team, uh, particularly. You want them just kind of doing what's right. So maybe that's good from the Supreme Court. You don't like all the decisions they make. That's maybe good. I'm not sure. But, uh, We'll keep this thing moving and end with our Reddit Christianity question of the week. So let me get this pulled up. Do you want to read this question? Says, why is boycotting considered to be non-Christ-like? Yeah, so there's a whole long statement there. We're not going to read any of it because it's weird and doesn't make a lot of sense. He kind of goes on to like genocidal denial and... Weird stuff, so I'm not going to read it all. It's just a bizarre. question is enough. The question's all I cared about yeah. because it's an interesting one. And it's uh, something that I have heard a handful of times. I don't know how often. I thought, you know, I've answered this question myself personally, so let's just talk about it. So I have never heard that boycotting, uh, that some people think it's non-Christ-like. I've never heard that before. Right. And it seems like a strange question to me. A few times I've heard it, I've always been like, what are you talking about? Right. Seems weird. But I have heard people make this uh, statement. I even went and looked for some articles. So I found one here. This is from the Gospel Coalition back in 2012. Should Christians boycott boycotting? (laughs) And then um, here's another one that was written. And this is five reasons Christians shouldn't boycott. So you know, like the homelessness thing, you know, I have my views on it, but I'd like to know your guys' thoughts um, just in case I'm wrong on this. But, you know, my thoughts are that this is kind of stupid. Of but course we should boycott. Kind of go along with what we just talked about a little bit. Like, isn't that in a sense kind of boycotting if you don't want to go to a certain restaurant because there's a homelessness crisis in that area and you don't want to yeah. I don't know. Like if they're Quit not boycotting the stand. homeless encampments, go walk through them and step on a hypodermic needle. I don't want to. Well, you're the problem then. But I don't know. Maybe that's a bad example. But I think Christians should boycott. I mean, personally. Well, definitely. And I think I we should be. The argu- I don't know what the argument would be. Well, uh, we're going to read those. We're going to look at these five different reasons really quickly. But Yeah, because I didn't read um, them yet. Yeah, I think we should be boycotting far more than we do. The one that jumped to my mind immediately was we should be boycotting the Democrat and Republican Party until they can give us a worthwhile politician. This isn't about politics. Um, so let's look at these five reasons really quick. Okay. Um, the first one, do you want to read that, honey? Boycotts give us a false sense of accomplishment. That's number one. Number two says boycotts can take our eyes off the prize. Number three, honey. Boycotts are trusting in the wrong kind of power. Yep. Hmm. And then uh, number four is boycotts keep the fight going. (laughs) Number five says boycotts try to change hearts through force. Okay. Uh, Not sure I agree with much of those points there, but... um, those are at least five arguments why we shouldn't. Uh, again, I don't agree with I them, but them there explained. are arguments. So I think boycotts are effective. And I think they've proven to be effective in recent times. You know, I don't know. I've heard people talk about it, so I'm sure you guys have as well. But how sort of tame overall this Pride Month was yeah. compared to like the right. last couple of years. This year was relatively mild. And, you know, 
there could have been a lot of reasons, but one of those could have been the boycott of places like Target last year Mm -hmm. might have actually proved to be a success. And we talk about it a lot on this show that, you know, this nation says it's 65% Christian. And if that's true and Christians use their money to have influence, you know, we could be steering the ship in this nation. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why we don't, but we certainly don't. Um, now we can't boycott everything all the time, of course, but we can be smart about it. Like we were with target, you know, the Bud Light boycott was super effective, you know, but I'm fully in favor of this. And again, I wish that we would do it more, you know, like Disney, all Christians should be boycotting Disney. Oh, maybe not gosh. forever, but if all yeah. the Christians in this nation stop spending money on Disney or watching Disney for like six months to a year. That company would have to change. They would have to because if 65% of this nation just never gave them another cent, they would have to make a dramatic change, you know. But I feel like we hear this idea because one of the points this guy brought up was uh, we're trusting in the wrong kind of power. And I feel like you hear this a lot, you know, the whole uh, just leave it up to God, you know, let God take care of it or something like that. But Like, how do we suppose God is going to take care of things? Okay, I'm just reading what that they say after that. Boycotts are trusting in the wrong kind of power. It says, when we boycott, we are stepping outside of the way God has chosen to work through the church. In a boycott, there's no grace, no love, no forgiveness demonstrated, only raw political, economic, and social power. Yeah, well, God gave us, um, you know, we're here. We we can... Like, yeah. Show target That's grace just, and put your kid in that, you know, LGBTQ pride flag. These are the t-shirt. same people that would say, got to keep your kids in the public school system. And they're evangelizing just, there. And they would just be like, yeah, they would say that. We're just going to pray for them. We're just going to pray for them. Don't, yeah. Don't, um, you know, confront. Don't confront people. But like, I think this is how God often works. You know, he's working through people acting and doing um, what he would want them to do. This is how God, gosh, have you read the Old Testament? God raises up um, armies to go against, you know, others, other cities. And he didn't raise up Joshua to go and show grace. Yeah. The people in Canaan. <laughs> like it's def he's definitely like about politics too. <laughs> right. And I think God works most often through his people. And again, if this church in this nation actually wanted to start making changes for the positive, which again, I don't like the label of Christian nationalism. I like the cra- the label of like putting people that love God and want to do what's right in his eyes in charge. You know, if we actually desire to do that we could see this nation change to the positive potentially. And boycotting is just one of those avenues, right? Stop spending your money and giving your money and influence to godless people who hate you. I don't see how that's a problem. I don't know. Who wrote this article? Like someone from Matt Chandler's uh, church? (laughs) Yeah, I'm not sure. It's just like a random website that I found. But, um, you know, it's not like the New York Times or anything, but just they made some points. So, Uh, what do you guys think, right? We certainly think boycotting is first off effective. And secondly, I think it's right. I mean, it's a nonviolent way to make a point. Like it's very clever, which is very important, (laughs) but it's even just like, I'm telling you to stop giving your money to Disney. Like, is that wrong? If I just went to my friends, like, listen, man, they're trying to kind of groom your kids. It's not good. You shouldn't support them. Is that fine? But then if I get on a microphone and tell 100 people to stop giving their money, that becomes wrong now. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, You know, but what do you guys think? Is boycotting unchrist like? We know it's effective, but is it unchrist like? It it just seems dumb to ask to me because I think these five reasons are ridiculous. Like, who really believes that? Sure. Come on. Like, this seems like a joke to me. Sure. But I also would have said it seems really stupid for a faith-based artist 
to bring Haley Welch on stage and get a yeah, there here we are. These right? are the same people. This person was a, a pro mask person. They were loving their neighbor by wearing their mask. I guarantee it. How could they not be? <laughs> um, so I would love to know what you guys think. Cause again, you know, we only know what we know. We think what we think. Um, but I'm open to correction. I feel pretty good about boycotting, but let me know where I'm wrong or just cement me in my opinions. I am so motivated now to go and research more. I just, I want to boycott more places now. Yes. I want to boycott the coffee shop we went to that creeped us out. Um, oh, but anyways, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any final thoughts here on boycotting or just anything that we've talked about in general today? Yeah, I just, yes. Nikki's fired up now about boycotting. Share. Yeah, share all the, the places you boycott and why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want to know. Learn. Don't we won't go where... anywhere anymore because everybody, every business supports something we don't agree with. <laughs> yeah, don't tell us whether we're right or wrong in boycotting. Tell us we're right and then give us other companies <laughs> to boycott. That's what we really want. We just want to stop spending money. Yes, please. It'll be helpful um, for us. But yeah, let us know if we're wrong. We're open to What did we boycott constructive... before? Netflix. That's right. We still are boycotting Netflix. We still are boycotting Netflix. Yep. Um, ever since they came out with, what was it, Cuties? Yeah. Yep. Haven't gotten back on board with that. So for our recommended listening this week, uh, I kind of wanted to go out in left field just because of something I heard. And, you know, we usually try to give recommended listening that's topical to what we talked about, but this is a Christian show and we like theology and, you know, the study of Christian doctrine and, you know, the attributes of God and all those sorts of things. So I found a video that I was listening to by a church we never went to, but we've listened to a lot online, The Cross. And their video, they have three Reformed theologians who got God's immutability wrong. Okay, what does immutability mean again? It is God's unchanging nature. Okay. Um, so this is from a report, uh, reformed perspective. So, you know, if you're not reformed, you know, at least listen to it. I think it's, mm. it's not terribly long, 15, 16 minutes, but, you know, just some good, it's always good to ponder who God is. I, mean, I heard somebody those... say before, um, <laughs> they read the attributes of God every year just to sort of refresh their mind on Which one? this God we serve. I think the A.W. Pink. Okay. No one can read the Stephen Charnock every year. My goodness. <laughs> um, so go give that a listen. And then we will be back tomorrow with our family devotion on Genesis 25. I will be back next week doing the daily shorts through Genesis 26. And then, of course, we will see what the world has for us. Um, hopefully, we'll be coming back with some great, positive, uplifting news that Haley Welch rejected the sinful you know pressure of this world and she gave her heart to the lord and we will come back with a list of places to boycott yes give us companies to boycott and we'll blast them on our podcast so all right we'll see you guys next week god bless